So this week, as I said, we're going to see a, a promise 25 years in the making come to pass. We'll also look at one strange incident, strange incident. I know it's unusual for me to teach about strange incidents in the Bible, but we're just going to do something different this week. And then we'll get some insight from the New Testament of the Bible that will completely change the way that we see and understand the text we're going to look at today in Genesis 21. It's going to affect each of our lives in a powerful way. So let's jump in. Genesis 21, verse 1, we read this. And the Lord visited Sarah... And then underline, as he had said, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Underline, as he had spoken. This is the only possible outcome when God gives us his word and makes us a promise. The Lord cannot lie. So whenever God makes a promise, this is how the story will go. And by the way, let me always say this. Your life is not the one exception to that rule. You are not the one person on the planet that God is not going to keep his promises to. He's perfectly faithful all the time. Verse 2, for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. And then underline this, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And so I love that. In verses 1 and 2, you have it happening as he had said, as he had spoken, and at the set time of which God had spoken to him. God is perfectly faithful. Abraham is 100 years old. Sarah is around 90. And the time finally comes. One baffles at how that's possible, but one doesn't want to think too long about it because it happened. God keeps his promise. And against every bit of logic and every bit of biology, the Lord does something miraculous. And Sarah, a woman who has spent her whole life being barren, gives birth to the son that the Lord had promised Abraham 25 years earlier. This was an incredible miracle and had been a long time coming, to say the least. And would you just make a note of this and and make a note in your heart as well? God's ability to keep his promises does not diminish with time. God's ability to keep his promises does not diminish with time. Regardless of how we feel, The odds, the chances of God keeping his promises do not go down as time passes. We feel like they do. We think they do. But they don't. Because every promise God makes, he will keep. He's perfectly faithful and he is able. Sarah must have thought, he's 100. I'm 90. There's got to be an expiration on this promise, God. It's got to be too late. But not for the Lord. Not for the Lord. And if the Lord has given you a promise and you know it's from Him, I don't care how much time has passed, God is no less able to fulfill it now than He was when He gave you the promise. He's completely able and He's completely faithful and He will do it. Verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. You might recall back in Genesis 17, the Lord had instructed Abraham that when the son was born, he was to name him Isaac. Verse 4, then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Circumcision, we've talked about it before, was kind of like a Jewish gang tattoo. You knew who was in and who was not. It was pretty obvious, okay? Verse 5, now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will, and then underline, laugh with me. Laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And though there had doubtless been many tears for Sarah across the decades of her barrenness, the day had now arrived when the tears were tears of joy. And I love that heart of God. I love that heart of Jesus that's shown in this moment. Because if you'll recall, back in Genesis 18, Jesus came to visit Abraham and and Sarah was eavesdropping on their conversation from just inside the door of the tent. And Jesus told Abraham, I'll just read it to you. Jesus told Abraham, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And in response to hearing that, the Bible tells us that Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, speaking of Abraham, being old also? And then it says that Jesus said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh 
saying, surely I will bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And Jesus said, no, but you did laugh. So before that exchange, really understand this, before that exchange between Jesus and Sarah happened, before that, a different time, earlier, the Lord had told Abraham, when you have this son, you are to name him Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter. It means laughter. You see, the Lord was looking ahead to that moment when Sarah would laugh in disbelief and mockery at the idea that God would give her a child. And yet the heart of Jesus was not, oh yeah, you doubt me, Sarah? Well, just for that, you'll be cursed forever. Which is sometimes how we view God. We look back at our mistakes and failures and we think, well, I must have blown it. Maybe there was a promise from God one time, but, but not anymore. Not after the mistakes that I've made. Now God is just punishing me and everything bad that's happening in my life is just God punishing me. But that wasn't the heart of Jesus. Not for Sarah, not for you, not for me. The heart of Jesus was, Sarah, I know that me doing something this wonderful seems laughable to you right now. But Sarah, the day is coming when you and I are going to laugh together about how wonderful what I'm going to do for you is going to be. We're going to laugh together, Sarah. That's the heart of Jesus. See, you might laugh in disbelief over some of God's promises. You might think they couldn't possibly be true for your life. But the Lord says, hey, if you'll walk with me, the day is going to arrive when we're going to laugh together over how wonderful the things I'm going to do in your life are going to be. And you know, Sarah often gets a bad rap from Christians when we read the Bible. We, we read about her laughing at God's promise and we, we shake our head and we say, faithless, faithless Sarah, shame on you. You should have trusted God. And we sometimes forget that it had been at least 24 years since she had first been given that promise by God that she would have a son. 24 years! Can you imagine God giving you a promise? You're going to get a promotion. I'm going to give you a spouse. I'm going to use you to reach people with the gospel. I'm going to heal your body. And 24 years later, it still hasn't happened. If that happened to a friend of yours, would any of us say to them, shame on you for doubting. You should be having faith. It's only been 24 years. Well, none of us would. Of course not. We'd probably all be saying, are you really sure that you heard from the Lord 24 years ago? Like on a scale of 1 to 10, how sure are you that you heard from the Lord? Is it possible that maybe the pizza was a little off, right? That's what we'd be doing. The Apostle Paul, he writes about the Old Testament Scriptures, and he tells us why they're still relevant for our lives as New Testament Christians. Paul says this, it's on your outlines. He says, for whatever things were written before, that's speaking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That's why they're still there for us to read, that we might have hope. Most things in the Old Testament are extreme examples of things that still involve us today. In this instance, the scenario is waiting for God to fulfill a promise. 24 years is a pretty extreme amount of time, but we can all relate to the difficulty of keeping faith as we wait for God to fulfill a promise. Would you agree that 25 years is a long time? Absolutely, that's a long time. But the Lord put this in here so that we could read this story today and as Paul said, have hope. Hope that He's a God who keeps His promises. Hope that what the Lord says about His Word in Isaiah 55 is true when He says, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You see, often we lose faith far too soon. The Lord gives us a promise. We know it's from Him. And yet we say, you know, I've been saved three months now, Lord, and I still don't have a Christian boyfriend or girlfriend. I mean, maybe I should just date a non-believer. Or we say, you know, my kids haven't been walking with Jesus for, for five years now. 
Maybe they're never going to turn to the Lord. Or it's been 10 years and my spouse still hasn't turned to Jesus. Maybe I should just divorce them and marry a believer. Or I'm still not healed. It's been a while. God told me he was going to do it, but maybe this is just how it's going to be. And through this passage, the Lord would say to you and I, hold on to hope. Don't give up. Keep the faith. Hold on to hope. And sometimes we do keep the faith, but we keep the faith half-heartedly, right? We begin to say, well, well maybe that promise from God was, was allegorical. Maybe it wasn't literal. Maybe that promise will come true in eternity. And that's what it means. And sometimes that's true, but let's be honest, a lot of the times that, that's a cop-out for us when we've run out of faith to believe it's going to happen in the here and now. We say it's all, it's all going to come together in eternity, which is true. It's the safest assumption you can make if you're a believer. Absolutely, but you don't really need faith for that. That's just going to happen. Let me encourage you with one of my favorite songs. I love this. It's, it's on your outline. David wrote this. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord, where? In the land of the living. In the land of the living. And then David gives this counsel in the very next verse to the man or woman who's on the edge of losing hope in the goodness of God. His very next words are, wait on the Lord. And while you're waiting, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say. Wait on the Lord. David says, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope that you'll see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And yet perhaps you find yourself thinking, but, but why, Lord? Why, why the waiting at all? I mean, you could do it right now. So, so why are we waiting? Well, our brother Paul tells us that trials and difficulties are a good thing because they produce patience in us. And he says, patience is good because patience produces character in you. We begin to grow in our faith as our spiritual character develops. And we begin to learn how to hope through difficulty across days, weeks, months, and even years. And then Paul writes this wonderful thing about hope in the life of the believer. On your outlines, he says, now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope does not disappoint. What does the Bible say? It says, all who hope in the Lord will what? Not be put to shame. There is no scenario in which you hope and put your faith in the goodness of God and end up looking stupid for doing so. The Lord will not let that happen. If God gave you a promise, God will keep that promise one way or another. Another brother, James, tells us something similar in his letter. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, James tells us that when we're in that gap of time between God's promise and the promise coming true, the fulfillment of the promise, when we're in that gap between those two things, that's when we learn how to be patient. And patience is critical because it develops us to become more like Jesus. And in that time when we're waiting for God to fulfill His promise to us, James says what's really being tested in that gap is our faith. It's our faith. You see, if I can see it, if I can touch it, if I don't have to wait for it, then I don't need faith. I don't need faith to believe that this music stand is right here. I need faith for what I can't see. I need faith for what isn't here yet. I need faith for what I can't see coming, but I know the Lord has said is. That's where faith grows, in that gap between the promise and fulfillment. That's the only place that faith grows grows. And so God says, if I'm going to grow faith in you, we got to camp out here for a while every now and then and grow some faith and develop some faith. That's what the Lord is doing. The Lord has not forgotten. He's not indifferent to your situation. He's just doing something even bigger and even more important than that thing you're waiting on. 
He's growing your faith. Write this down. The Lord wants to use the gap between His promise and its fulfillment to develop our faith. To develop our faith. And oftentimes it's revealed to us by our behavior and attitude while we're in that gap that our faith is not really where we thought it was. It's not what we thought it was. Not as strong as we thought it was. And even that is a precious, precious gift. That realization, that clarity, because the Lord is revealing to us that we have a need to grow in faith while we still have time to grow in faith. I know when I get to heaven, when I get to see the Lord face to face, the opportunity to walk by faith and not by sight will be over. There is no need anymore to walk by faith and not by sight because the Lord is there. The opportunity to earn eternal rewards will be over. The opportunity to be faithful with little in this life so that I can be entrusted with much in eternity will be over. And so the Lord is gracious. He says, every now and then I'm going to give you some insight into where your faith is really at. So that if it needs to grow, you can see that. And you can change. And you can grow while there's still time to grow. And if the Lord is revealing to you in this season that your faith is not where you thought it was, can I just encourage you to be humble with the Lord about that? To, to say, Lord, please help me. My faith is not where I thought it was. It's not where I want it to be. But I know that you are trustworthy. I know you are deserving of my faith. So, so God, help me to honor you by walking in faith in this gap between your promise and its fulfillment. Have that attitude and let the Lord grow your faith. Let Him grow your faith. And we don't know how it's going to work, but, but what we notice in the Bible is that there seems to be no character trait that God cares more about developing in the life of the believer than faith. There's nothing He cares about developing more. He doesn't care about you being nice more than He cares about faith. He doesn't care about you even memorizing the entire Bible more than he cares about faith. Faith is so important. It's everything in the scriptures. You cannot be saved without faith. It's everything according to the Bible. And so all we can conclude is that somehow the faith that we leave this life with, the faith that we enter eternity with, is going to have a profound impact on what we do with and for the Lord in all of eternity. Because God spends our entire life trying to grow our faith. It is the most urgent, pressing work that He does in our lives. Getting us to the place of trusting Him in a greater and greater way. That's His number one passion in our lives. Now we're going to shift gears. Now we're going to take a look at a different incident in the same chapter. We're going to read through the next chunk of text together. I'm going to explain it. And then we're going to look at what Paul says about this in the New Testament. And we'll get some incredible insights as we go through his insights. So verse 8, it says, So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. So Isaac is now old enough that he can move from his mother's milk to eating solid food. And to celebrate this occasion, Abraham throws a big feast. And Isaac's likely at least about three years old at this time, based on what we know about the history and culture. But you may recall there's another son in the picture at this time too, Ishmael. When Sarah had lost faith in God's promise of a son, she attempted to bring about the fulfillment of that promise by having Abraham sleep with her maidservant, an Egyptian woman named Hagar. And then they decided that the offspring would be this promised son that God had talked about. And this offspring was named Ishmael who now is around the age of 17, and obviously is not the son that God had promised. Verse 9, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, that's Ishmael, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing, underlying scoffing, or, or mocking is another way to put it. Therefore she, Sarah, said to Abraham, Cast this bondwoman and her son, cast out this bondwoman and her son, 
4 and then underline, the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. So here's what's happened. Ishmael's around 17 years old. By that time, he's for all intents and purposes a man, a young man in the culture. Old enough to be married, old enough to have his own job, his own vocation. He's old enough to be responsible and to know how to conduct himself. And Sarah observes him scoffing, mocking, teasing, making fun of her biological son, little three-year-old Isaac. And the word that's used there for scoffing in the original Hebrew has a lot of different meanings. It can mean anything from verbal taunting to physical harm. And the point is that whatever is going on is serious enough that Sarah looks on and says, Abraham, it's not going to be enough that we just simply try to keep them apart like you sometimes do, brothers, in a family. She says, whatever's going on is so serious, they cannot coexist together. These two sons cannot be in the same family. They, they gotta go, they gotta go. And obviously, this is hugely troubling to Abraham. As we've talked about before, Abraham spent 13 years believing and thinking that Ishmael was the son of promise. He thought, this is it, he's here, he's gonna be the guy. He was his only son. They had still waited over 80 years for him. And so Abraham loved him dearly as an only son. And now his wife is saying, you've got to kick him out of the family. Verse 12. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. The Lord tells Abraham, Abraham, listen, what Sarah is telling you to do is my will. Do what she's asking. My plans are going to flow through Isaac, but because you love Ishmael, I'm going to take care of him and make him a great nation as well. And we know from history that Ishmael will go on to become the father of the Arab people. And I just want to revisit that one phrase that the Lord said to Abraham. He said, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. Whatever Sarah has said to you, Abraham, listen to her voice. Abraham, whatever your wife has said to you, listen to her. And husbands, I, I can't help wondering if the Lord might be trying to say something to us today. You know, nothing comes to mind. Let's move on. So let, let, me, just, let me just say this. Most of us husbands know Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. You know, perhaps like me, you have that verse framed up above your fireplace. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But just remember that in the very verse before that, in Ephesians 5.21, it says we're to live our lives submitting to one another in the fear of God. You see, in God's design for marriage, there's submission to one another. It's only that if the husband believes his wife is erring in a serious way that he is to step in out of a fear of the Lord and overrule her as the leader of the family. Husbands, it is a glorious and terrible thing to realize that the Lord will speak to you through your wife. It's glorious for your spirit, but it's terrible for your ego and for your flesh. Praise God for that. So why did the Lord speak to Abraham through Sarah? It's because Abraham didn't want to hear what the Lord was saying on that issue. It's that simple. He loved Ishmael, and so he wasn't open to a direct message. I know we've all done that. Lord, do you have anything to say to me? The Lord has something to say. And we're like, anything at all, Lord. And he's hitting on something we don't want to hear. We're like, anything, nothing? Okay, I guess, I guess we're done. So Abraham was not open to hearing from the Lord that message about Ishmael. So the Lord spoke to him through Sarah and then followed up with Abraham. And that's often how it works, husbands and wives. Sometimes there are things that we're simply not open to hearing from the Lord directly. So the Lord speaks to us through our spouse and then follows up by telling our spirit, yes, 
that is me talking to you through them. You know they're right. And both husbands and wives need to understand that there are areas and issues on which our spouse can more easily hear from the Lord than we can. Because we have prejudices, we have pre-existing beliefs, we have biases, and, and we have things that we don't want to talk about. We need each other. And we need to submit to the Lord, the Holy Spirit that resides in our spouse. Because He will speak to us through them. So keep that in mind. Verse 14 so Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God, that would be Jesus when it's the angel of God, called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. You might recall even that back in Genesis 16, the Lord had promised Hagar that Ishmael would become a great nation. And so here is the Lord keeping that promise to Hagar, keeping the promise he made to Abraham, providing for and protecting Ishmael and Hagar. And it's really easy to read what Abraham did and see it as harsh because after all, he's the wealthiest man on the earth in all likelihood at this time. And yet he sends out Ishmael with a loaf of bread and a single skin of water, single water bottle basically. What's going on? Don't forget that as we've said, Abraham loved Ishmael. In this very chapter, we've read about how troubled he was when Sarah asked that he be sent away. There's nothing in Abraham that wished any harm on Ishmael. What's actually going on here is that Abraham's faith has grown tremendously. In this very chapter, we read that the Lord told Abraham not to worry about Ishmael because he would take care of him. He would make him a great nation. And Abraham realized, you know, he can't become a great nation if he dies later today in the wilderness. That's going to be pretty hard to pull off. Therefore, he's not going to die out there in the wilderness. He's going to become a great nation. And so Abraham is now at the point where he doesn't just believe in God, he believes God. And so what he's doing is he's saying, this is all you need because you've got something better. You've got an actual promise from God that he's going to take care of you. So I don't need to send you out with a thousand servants. I don't need to send you out with soldiers to protect you and watch your back. The Lord is looking out for you and He is really going to take care of you. So Abraham just releases him into the Lord's care. Make a note of this. Abraham believed God's promise that he would take care of Ishmael. Abraham believed God's promise that he would take care of Ishmael. Parents, you know, the Lord has given us a promise concerning our children. Right in His Word, you know it. The Word says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And like Abraham, if you are a mom or a dad who is doing your best to raise your kids to love the Lord and to know the Lord, you have a promise from God saying, I am. I'm going to be watching out for them. I am going to be working in their lives. And when it is all said and done, they'll be with me. Hold on to that promise. Hold on to that promise. There might be bumps. There might be detours along the way. There might be epic failures. But hold on 
to the promise of God because God does not make promises flippantly. He doesn't work that way. Now let's shift to the New Testament book of Galatians. I'll give you a minute to turn there. It's a little bit more difficult to find than the book of Genesis in the New Testament. You're probably going to be about three quarters of the way through your Bible. The New Testament book of Galatians. It's the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. And in chapter 4 of Galatians, turn there, chapter 4 of Galatians, Paul will give us profound insight into this whole incident where Abraham cast out Hagar and Ishmael. We're going to begin in verse 21 of chapter 4 of Galatians. This is what it says. Paul says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. So in this church in Galatia, there was a situation unfolding that was fairly common in the church during the first few decades of its existence. Many of the believers, many of these new Christians were Jewish, and so they would often argue with the Christians that they all still needed to obey every letter of the law that was in the Old Testament including ceremonial aspects of the law like circumcision, ritual hand washing, all that stuff. And this, of course, goes directly against what Jesus taught, which is that we're saved by the grace of God, which gives us the righteousness of Jesus. We're not justified, we're not made right with God by our own goodness, but because God gave us His goodness, the righteousness of Jesus. And so Paul writes for a moment, to this group of Jewish believers in Galatia who are pushing for Christians to still live under the Old Testament law. And he says to them, guys, pay attention to what took place all the way back in Genesis. Father Abraham had two sons, one from a slave, Hagar, and one from a free woman, Sarah. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, underline symbolic. So the Bible teaches us that we are made up of two main parts, the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is the part of us that's physical and is tied to this earth. Our spirit is the part of us that is eternal, that will live forever. And when the whole universe fell into sin, all the way back with Adam and Eve, our flesh and our spirit fell into sin as well. They became corrupted. They became broken. When we became believers by giving our lives to Jesus, our spirit was born again. It was made new. God gave us a new spirit. He put His spirit in us and He did a great work in us. However, our flesh remains corrupted and sinful. Our spirit is tied to heaven. Our flesh is still tied to this earth. We'll get new bodies we'll get uncorrupted flesh when we go to be with the Lord. But until then, we're in this strange state where our spirit belongs to the Lord, but our flesh essentially belongs to this world. And there's this war within us between the two, moment by moment, day by day. The spirit wants to live for the Lord, while the flesh wants to live for itself and for its own lusts. The flesh wants to live for the things that are going to bring it satisfaction right now, immediately, whether they're what God wants or not. And so Paul tells us that the fundamental difference between Ishmael and Isaac is this. Ishmael was brought about through a work of the flesh, while Isaac was brought about by a work of the Spirit. Verse 29 is going to tell us that explicitly. Ishmael was the result of Sarah and Abraham trying to make something happen by disregarding God's plans and ways and pursuing their own idea of what would bring life. Isaac was the result of God's promise and God's miraculous work, which is how God produces life. And so Paul tells us that while this Genesis account is very real, it's also symbolic. And the symbolism is this, write this down. Isaac is a picture of the spirit, while Ishmael is a picture of the flesh. Isaac is a picture of the spirit, while Ishmael is a picture of the flesh. And this insight allows us to read Genesis 21 with a whole nother level of understanding. Paul goes on and he says, For these are the two covenants, 
the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Let me explain. I know it sounds complicated. Paul says there's two covenants as well. There's two systems represented by the two mothers in Genesis 21, Sarah and Hagar. Hagar represents the Old Testament law that was given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. The law, that system where one tries to be righteous by being good enough to meet God's standards by perfectly obeying every single one of God's laws and never failing at one of them. It's the system that the Jews in Jerusalem at that time were following, and the result of it was bondage. Because it's a system that tries to bring about good things, that tries to bring about life in the flesh. Saying that in my flesh, which is corrupt and wicked and evil, I'm going to somehow produce good things. It's destined for failure. And he says, in contrast, however, Sarah represents grace. That system where the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is what makes us righteous and good enough for God's standards. It's the system that rules in heaven, the eternal Jerusalem, and the result of the system of grace is freedom. So the law, the works of the flesh, produce bondage. Grace, the work of the Spirit, produces freedom. Write this down. Hagar is a picture of the law, while Sarah is a picture of grace. Hagar is a picture of the law. Sarah is a picture of grace. He goes on in verse 27 and says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Believers are born of the Spirit and they belong to the kingdom of God. Verse 29. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. So Paul says, listen, until Jesus returns to rule on the earth, the flesh is always going to be opposed to the Spirit. The flesh is always going to persecute the Spirit. The flesh is always going to mock the Spirit. The kingdom of man, the kingdom of Satan will persecute the kingdom of God. The flesh in me will mock the Spirit in me. And this will play out within each of us. It will even play out between countries until the Lord returns to reign on the earth. And the point that Paul is making is that the Spirit and the flesh cannot coexist. Just as Sarah looked at Ishmael and Isaac and said, they can't live together in the same house. The flesh and the Spirit will never live in harmony. They are intrinsically opposed to each other. And here's the problem. Only one will ever win. At any given moment in time, your flesh or the Spirit of God in you is winning, is ruling, is reigning, is calling the shots. They will not rule together. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, Paul tells us, verse 30, Nevertheless, he says, what does the Scripture say? And then underline the rest of this. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So Paul says the solution is to tell our flesh, you got to go. You got to get out of here. In every situation, every day, write this down, we have to cast out the flesh and live by the Spirit. In every situation, every day, we have to cast out the flesh and live by the Spirit. Say, the Spirit, God in me, is going to call the shots in my life, not my flesh. And this is probably where you're thinking, hey, that sounds great, Jeff. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, first off, I know this sounds simple, but we can't cast out the flesh and live by the Spirit unless we want to. That's the first thing. You have to actually want to. And while it would be wonderful if we all wanted to live by the Spirit simply because we trusted God, loved God, and believed His Word, 99.999999% of the time, we only get serious about wanting to live by the Spirit once we discover from experience 
that what the Word says about living by the flesh really is true. When Paul wrote in Romans, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see, the way that we want to live by the Spirit is that we have some experience in life where we begin to realize that living by the flesh, being carnally minded, isn't producing life and peace in me. It's producing death. I can't sleep well. I never feel rested. I'm doing whatever I want, but I never feel at peace. There's constant conflict and dissatisfaction in all of my relationships. I'm always chasing happiness, but I can never grab a hold of it for more than a moment. And in Galatians, Paul also wrote, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. The literal word there is stench. What's going to come back to you will stink. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You see, what makes us want to actually live by the Spirit is when we get sick and tired of realizing that living by the flesh is producing a certain harvest in our life, a certain return in our life. The things that are coming back around are not very enjoyable. We begin to realize that. So firstly, we cast out the flesh by recognizing and remembering what living by the flesh produces in our lives. It makes us want to live by the Spirit. That's the first step. You have to want to live by the Spirit. Secondly, in Romans 13, we are told to, this is on your outlines, this is huge, Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, don't feed your flesh. Don't empower your flesh. Don't provide for your flesh. Don't nourish it. Don't take it to places that recharge it. And now we understand what else was going on when Abraham sent Ishmael out into the wilderness. Ishmael, a picture of the flesh, with no provisions. It was a picture of this verse, making no provision for the flesh. Each of us, being led by the Holy Spirit, have to feed our spirit but starve our flesh. We have to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit as He tells us what's good for us and what is not. We have to ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, Lord, is this going to produce life? Is this going to feed the spirit in me or is this going to feed the flesh? Because if it's going to feed the flesh, Lord, I'm not interested. Help me. You see, it's a father-child relationship where we actually trust our Heavenly Father to determine what's good for us. Because we realize that our judgment isn't really all that good. It means we begin to ask questions like, is that show? Is that music? Is that relationship? Is that place feeding my spirit or feeding my flesh? I hope it's coming across clearly that the flesh and the spirit cannot coexist. And I say that because many of us end up in tragic, tragic situations as a result of trying to get the flesh and the spirit to live together in harmony, to be best buds. It is impossible. And yet that's exactly what we do when we make the decision to say, my, my closest friends are going to be non-believers. The Bible says that we don't share a future. We don't share an inheritance. And the end result is that when our closest friends are non-believers, the, the flesh is going to end up persecuting the spirit, not the other way around. That is to say that their, their values and behavior are going to eventually rub off on me, not the other way around. Can you have friends who are not believers? Absolutely. Can they be your closest friends? That'd not be wise according to the scriptures. Because the flesh and the spirit cannot coexist. One will win out. Amos 3, 3, we all know it says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? When the day comes when Abraham finally dies, Ishmael will be there to bury him with Isaac. You see, in that culture at that time, when a person died, they would bury them that same day or the next day at the absolute latest. That means that when Abraham died, Ishmael was not very far away. He was able to get there quickly. 
All that to say that that relationship ended up being restored between Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. But that relationship would have been completely destroyed had they tried to keep everyone together in the same house. My point is this. He who's born of the Spirit can love he who is born of the flesh from a distance. There has to be a healthy distance. They can't coexist in close, intimate fellowship. Parents, again, there's a lesson for us in Abraham's behavior toward his son, Ishmael, typologically. And this is the lesson. Don't feed the flesh. If you have a child of any age that's walking in the flesh instead of the spirit, both Abraham and Paul would give the same counsel. Don't feed their behavior. Don't empower their behavior. Don't sponsor their behavior. Don't underwrite their behavior. Financially, emotionally, in any way. Don't provide for them so that they can keep walking in the flesh. Do you remember the story Jesus himself told, the parable of the prodigal son? I would urge you as parents to remember that in that story, we all know from the get-go that the father's heartbroken. We know the father is praying for his son to return from the day that he leaves. We know the father is on the roof looking every day to see if today's the day the son is going to return. But we notice that what the father does not do is send the son money when he runs out. He doesn't send a care package. And he doesn't chase after his son when his son runs into the wilderness of the world. He allows the emptiness of living to the flesh to be revealed to his son. Because he understands, listen, my son is only going to desire to live by the Spirit when he comes to the realization that living by the flesh produces a harvest of death. He must have that realization, and when he does, he will return. And you can bet your life that any parent in that situation is praying that today will be the day their kid will have that realization. But do not make any provision for the flesh. Don't do it. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to deal with the flesh. How are you going to do that? I'm going to lay down the law. I'm going to come up with a whole bunch of rules to keep me from walking in the flesh and keep me walking in the spirit. And the irony of that is by doing that, you have just put yourself back under the law. Back into trying to live in the flesh and be good and righteous in the flesh. So what's the solution? Living by the Spirit. Go back and read John 14. Abiding in a relationship with Jesus. Being led moment to moment by the Holy Spirit. Living in a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Understanding that as Paul wrote, Paul wrote this, he said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify, not all things build up. In other words, you can do whatever you want if you're saved. Your salvation is not at stake. Jesus has paid for it all. You're forgiven. But listen, not everything that you can do is going to produce life and peace in your life. You can do whatever you want. It's not going to cost you your salvation. But you don't want to do it because you want the life and peace that Jesus wants to give you in this life. He's the best way to live right now. And if you live by the flesh, all you're going to reap is destruction and death in every area of your life. It's not about rules. It's not about trying to be right. It's about the relationship with the Father who looks at you and I and says, listen, I know the decisions that you could make that would lead you to happiness, lead you to peace, lead you to joy, lead you to rest. I know the decisions you need to make to live that way. And if you let me, I'll lead you in them. If you ask me, I'll show you. And we get to the point where we say, man, man I'm, not, I'm not doing this to try and keep rules. I'm doing this because I want the joy. I want the peace. I want the life. That, that's what I want. It's living by the Spirit, not by the law anymore. In conclusion, let me say this. As we read earlier, I'll read it again. David wrote, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. 
Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. And I just want to encourage you, if you've been losing hope, if you've been losing faith on what you know is a promise that God gave you in his word or gave to you personally, would you ask the Lord to strengthen your faith today? Would you take communion and remember that hundreds and hundreds of years, back when Adam and Eve fell, the Lord promised that he would make a way for them to be forgiven. And he did. He came through. Everything that the Lord has said he will do, he will do. So as you take communion, would you just remember God has kept his greatest promise already, and he'll keep his promise to you as well. And if you're in that place where you don't know what to pray, there's such encouragement to be found in the words of the father of a boy who was possessed, who asked Jesus, can you heal my boy? And Jesus said, you just got to have faith. You just got to believe. And I love what the father said. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. Maybe that's where you are today. You say, Lord, I believe, but, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Would you ask him and believe that the Lord is going to give the gift of faith this evening? Let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, thank you so much for your goodness, God. Thank you that the things that you wrote in your word all the way back in the Old Testament are recorded and in our hands today that we might have hope. And so, Father, I pray for every one of us in this room who is in that gap between the promise and its fulfillment. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would give the gift of faith, Lord God, above and beyond anything that we could even attempt to stir up, Lord, the kind of faith that is gifted to us by your Spirit, Lord, to believe not simply in you, but to believe you, that every word you have said will come to pass, Lord. And Father, we ask in humility that you would forgive us where we have lost faith, Lord, simply because of time. We confess that time does not diminish your power or your ability to keep your promises. So, Lord, give us the gift of faith to believe you. Give us wisdom to know how to live by the Spirit and not to try and create harmony between the flesh and the Spirit, but to cast out the flesh, Lord, that we might walk in the freedom that only you can offer us, Jesus. 